that night, I had a dream and I woke up sweating in the middle of the night streaming because there were kids playing and then screaming at me and asking me to help them. Hello, my atypical daydreamers. Welcome to the show. My first guest today is Julia Melanta. She's a singer and songwriter based in Austin, Texas. Julia has been in some spooky situations, and today she shares a couple. But it's her last story that really makes me think that there's something greater guiding us through this life. So I was in England. And I was touring uh, with my friend Hamel on trial. And we were playing in this pub. And it was great. It's old and crooked, especially this pub it was really crooked. Like the building was just not, it was crooked. I noticed that in the green room, there was a tomb on the floor. And I was like, oh, okay, well, it makes sense that someone is buried here. Why not? I've never played right <laughs> across the room from from someone, you know, like a, a corpse or something that's buried underground. But that's totally cool because I'm cool with that. I'm cool with death. I'm cool with ghosts and whatever. I was spending the night above the pub. In the middle of the night, I was sleeping in this room and there was a cello in the corner and the cello played itself. And I was awake and it's not a dream. Also, I'm a light sleeper. It wasn't like a cello suite. It wasn't like Bach, da 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 It wasn't that. But it was like, bling, and nobody was in the room. And I was like, okay, that's, that's okay. That's cool. <laughs> it's not the first time. I, it, it, I was in England. <laughs> Again, I guess England is just crowded with ghosts because it's old. Uh, so I was playing in this convent that they repurposed and they turned into a recording studio slash um, concert venue. And, and the stage was actually the altar of the church. Already it's a pretty interesting setting. It's, it was a big building and everything was gray and, you know, kind of moldy. And, and I remember, and we were sleeping in one of the rooms, one of the nuns' rooms. And I remember this corridors with, with this horrible carpet, like the shining type thing. And, 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 you know, this long and narrow corridors with horrible carpet on the floor. And at the end of each corridor, there was a statue of the Virgin Mary or the statue of a nun, but they were not kind of friendly looking. They were, I remember feeling a bit uneasy. And that night I had a dream and I woke up sweating in the middle of the night, screaming, because there were kids playing and then screaming at me and asking me to help them. Which it was, a, you know, uh, I have a really, really um, a prolific dream life. I have so I, I dream every night. I have dream journals. I write them down. So I'm used to having intense dreams. And so then I kind of managed to fall back asleep for a little bit. Then the next morning I was downstairs having coffee and I was talking to the manager of the venue and what was this place before exactly? It was just a convent and he's like, well, this place was, yes, a convent and orphanage. There were kids here and at some point there was a big fire and a lot of kids died in that fire. Every time I tell the story, I can feel the hair at the back of my neck. I was about to die uh, when I was 12. Um, I was in a coma for a couple of days because I fell off a horse and I broke my skull. And I was in a coma for a couple of days. It wasn't a deep, deep coma. It was one of those, like, this was a light one, like a beginner's coma, <laughs> where you can actually, people can actually wake you up if they slap you or if they kind of, you know, yeah. 
So they were able to wake me up. And, and I remember this feeling of like, just can you just let me sleep? I'm so comfortable. People were slapping me and going like, what's your name? I was like, I don't know. So I was in this state, which is a light coma for a couple of days. And they were about to release me because I was doing better after like a couple of weeks. I was doing better. And then this is kind of my garden angel story or like lucky, fortunate coincidences, if you will. Because the chief of neurosurgery that was, that was here in Florence, he was like, well, Julia's doing fine. She's, you know, she's recovering. And uh, we are wondering whether we should, you know, discharge her because she's, she's okay now. But he said, I have a son that's Julia's age. And if this were my son, I would definitely open his head, his skull, and make sure everything is okay. I wouldn't just discharge him like this. He was a leading authority in neurosurgery or something. So he was someone they, they, were, they were relying on and trusting. And my parents were like, okay. So they did, and it was like a five-hour surgery. When they opened my skull, they found a little tiny, teeny tiny fragment of bone resting on a, on a vein, which was like a ticking bomb. Would have been a, a total, you know, ticking bomb. One day I would, you know, while drinking a cup of tea, bam, it could have exploded in my head and I would have died like this. So I'm like, wow, I'm lucky. I was lucky. But the story's not over because at some point I decided to go uh, to medical school because I wanted to be a doctor. And I actually became a doctor. It's a long, that's a really, really long story. But uh, I started medicine, then I quit. I moved to Barcelona. I started being a musician. Then I went back to Florence to get my degree that I never used. I am an MD with a degree in medicine and I never practiced not even one day. But so the story goes that at the first year of medical school, we were in the, uh, um, the morgue <laughs> uh, studying anatomy and doing like, you know, all of that, looking at bones and whatnot. And we were divided in little groups. And there was this guy, Gastone, and he told me his last name. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to give names or not. But anyway, he gave me his last name. And I was like, wait a second. Are you by chance the son of Professor blah, blah, blah that operated me in whatever year that was? And he said, yes, that's my dad. Because you're my same age, which is why we were attending the same year of medicine, he decided and he suggested that he would perform the surgery to make sure everything was okay. So I was like, well, thank you. I think you saved my life. Josh here. I love making this podcast and I'd love to make it my full-time gig. Besides telling the stories, I'm basically a one-man band and that takes time. If you're enjoying the podcast, please consider becoming a patron. You'll have access to loads of great bonus stories and you'll have the satisfaction of knowing that you're supporting a truly independent podcast. Find the Patreon link in the show notes. And thanks. My next guest is Ian Lee, back by popular demand. He's a drummer, songwriter, and he owns a tour bus company. Having been on many tours, Ian has been in some tight spots, but his story today is a real sweaty palm nail biter. So one of the things that you have to think 20 feet, 20 steps ahead with all driving things, it's not just like plug in the place that you're playing or the venue that you're playing or the city you're playing. You you don't just like plug it into your GPS and go. You have to have very, very, very specific, you know, driving instructions and have your plan very well executed. And you might not know this, but in New York City, for example, if you've ever been to New York City, there's only two 
ways that you can get into Manhattan from outside. You can take the George Washington Bridge or you can take the Lincoln Tunnel. A bus is 13 foot one inches and the Lincoln Tunnel is 13 feet high. So when you pull a bus into the Lincoln Tunnel, you have about an inch of clearance above your bus. So if you can imagine taking a bump a little too fast, just it, literally that much, you can knock the knock an air conditioner off the top of your bus. It's something like, it's, it's literally that close. It's so close that you, I have an antenna on the top of my bus for a, a CB radio and it scrapes the roof of the Lincoln Tunnel. So if you can imagine driving into Manhattan with the traffic like that, and you know, people are not exactly polite drivers there. And, and the reason I'm saying this is that the first time I was in my first bus on my first tour into Manhattan, I didn't know this. And I was in Manhattan and we tried leaving in, we tried to take the Midtown Tunnel and the bus is 13 feet high and the Midtown Tunnel is 12 foot 11 inches. So it's one inch short. And going into the Midtown Tunnel, the entrance to mid, the Midtown Tunnel. So I've got a bus with a trailer on the back and I'm going to the Midtown Tunnel because I didn't have a truck GPS that had the height restrictions flagged in it. So going into the Midtown Tunnel, you have three arterials. You have one coming from the east, one coming from the west, and one coming from straight on, and they're all four lanes. So you have technically 12 lanes of traffic converging on an entrance to the tunnel, all going in one way. And I get across and I get down in there and there's these bars above the tunnel these uh, that I clear under on the street and it's all midtown Manhattan. And then I pull down into the tunnel and there's a laser sight about 200 feet before you actually enter the tunnel. There's a laser sight that if you trip it, it sets off these alarms that, of course, I was an inch too tall and I tripped this alarm. So now I'm stuck in the entrance to the Midtown Tunnel in Manhattan with 12 lanes of cars around me and I'm heading. And if I go down into the tunnel, I'm going to get stuck. And of course, at the time when this is happening, as soon as the laser sight goes off the police who are walking all there there's like all these cops walking around you know walking around in the area the entrance of the tunnel directing traffic they all converge on the bus with guns pulled and start screaming at me to stop and that I have to turn around so I have to and I'm at this point I'm already down in the entrance to the tunnel so the walls are on my left and my right of the sides of the tunnel and they're about 60 the bus with the trailer is about 60 feet and the walls, there's probably 63 feet. So I have to back up. The cops start pushing 12 lanes of New York wall-to-wall -wall traffic. I mean, probably 12 lanes, 150 cars, five blocks deep behind them. <laughs> and I've got to back in and turn around and then drive into oncoming traffic I, I mean, I, to, I, it's one of these like out-of-body experience things where you, I don't even know how it actually, like how I'm not still stuck there right now, nine years later. But it was like the most incredibly stressful. I still have nightmares about it once in a while. I want to thank Julia and Ian for sharing their experiences. Be sure to check out Julia's music. She has two new singles, a third coming out March 22nd, and a full-length album coming out April 19th. Also, check out Ian's band, The Cleet Elm, and if you're in need of a tour bus, Affordable Tour Solutions has got you covered. This podcast was created and produced by me, Josh Caldwell. Music by Visual Aid, my side music project. General support and copywriting by Miranda Caldwell. If you like the show, please follow, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you'd like to financially support the show, check out my Patreon page. You'll have access to loads of great bonus stories. You can find the link in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come back next week.